What's going on, guys? Back for another episode of the Smack Talk podcast. I am JR Sports Media, your host. I'm here with Kevin Mesnick, as well as Jonathan Weathers, as well as former NFL running back Philip Tanner. How's it going? Man, it's going real well, man. Glad to be on, man. Definitely excited to be here. I appreciate you coming on, my man. Uh, just to get into things, what was it like to play at Middle Tennessee State University? I mean, I, I'm a big fan of college athletics. I know I watch their college football a lot. Had it up and down year last year. You know, two years ago, they, they came in first in, in the conference. What was it like to play for that alma mater? Man, it was, a, it was truly a, a life-changing experience, man. Not, not only for the school, but the entire city of, uh, of Murfreesboro. Changed my life, man. They welcomed me in open arms. Um, from the first day I got there, I took a Greyhound from Dallas to Murfreesboro, 14-hour trip. As soon as I got off the Greyhound bus, I was like, man, where in the hell am I at? You know? <laughs> so it, uh, it was a lot different from Dallas. Um, but from day one, man, Coach Stockstill, the entire athletic department, and the entire city of Murfreesboro welcomed me in open arms, and it just felt like a family. And one thing I say, man, Murfreesboro will always be home for me. So it was a great experience I'm just playing for a great school, a great program, and going out there, leaving out on the field, and, and just building strong bonds from every person I crossed paths with in Murfreesboro. Wow. That's a – I mean, playing for most Tennessee State University, obviously not, you know, the power conference. But what I what I like to get out of it is, you know, the conference Uf, USA teams, you know, those not – maybe overlook conferences. If you if you do contribute to the team and you're in the national spotlight, it's like being on, you know, a University of Hartford, uh, a lower D1, you know, program. So I think it, it's really interesting to see kids go to universities such as like that. And I think it's, in my, in my opinion, if I was as gifted as you are, Philip, I would do the same route, you know, try to get, I mean, NFL, former Dallas Cowboy running back, obviously you had some success in the league. So it's just really interesting to see your route and your path to get to where you were today. And, and, and that's the thing. Uh, and I learned that once I got to the NFL, I went through the draft process on the coaching side as far as recruiting players and things like that. Those small school kids, they, they got chips on their shoulders. Yeah, they got talent. Uh, yeah, and, and, they, and they, have, they have to prove it each and every day. And I tell guys all the time, if you can play, I don't care if you play under a rock, uh, NFL scout, they're going to come find you. Yeah, if, if you uh, see Max Crosby, as you can see, I'm rocking the Raiders gear. I see, I see. <laughs> Dog Max Crosby, fourth-round pick, he actually produced more sacks and better numbers this year than Joey Bosa. So, as you can see, diamond in the rough, Eastern Michigan, chip on the shoulder. It works out most of the time. Most definitely. Did you, uh, did you have other guys out of your program the same years as you that got scouted like that? Yeah, uh, we also had a guy that got drafted, uh, Rod Isaac. He got drafted in like six rounds, cornerback. Uh, we had Jamari Lattimore. He was a free agent guy, but went and played real well in uh, in Green Bay. Played a little bit in the Jets. So yeah, it was it was definitely guy. Then after that, man, it was just downhill from there. I think our biggest guy since I was been in since I started at Middle was Kevin Byer. You know, who, who was who was the highest paid safety right now in the NFL. You know, uh, but all kind of in the seven, just a ball hawk. So uh, Middle Tennessee, we we out there now. So check out, check us out now. Ball is that you? Yes, sir. So just in comparisons of this era compared to when you played in 2011 to 2013, how does this era of the NFL compare to when you played back in the days? Uh, it's different. Uh, it was, a, it was a definitely more physical when I played. <laughs> it was more physical. Uh, but, man, these guys are just freakish athletes. I will say that, man. I think year after year, the, the, the athleticism of these guys just shoots through the roof. You know, uh, guys are jump, jumping through the roofs, 4 two speed, you know, uh, and, and big, physical, and fast Yeah, at, at every position. You know, uh, you got to select you to run 4-2, select you to run 4-3. But after that, everybody else runs 4-4 four, four, and 4-5. Four, We're talking about bigs and all. So I just think the athleticism of these guys, this new generation, the, the Zeeks, the Saquon Barkley's, the McCaffrey's, these guys are different, you know. Uh, and it's amazing to be able to sit back and just watch them do what they do. And we still got an old head. We still got AP and Frank going holding it down for the old heads, man. They uh, the OGs, still, the still OGs. Go, yeah, they, <laughs> you know, they're still doing, doing what they do, man. So it's definitely exciting, man. But like I said, I will say just the athleticism and the, the speed of the game has changed from, of course, when I first got in. 
I mean, and you would know firsthand about the physicality rules because you scored a touchdown with no helmet on, right? Yeah. yeah I was yeah. I, I I was the one who just <laughs> learned that uh, recently when I when I uh, was researching you for this, and that's crazy, man. I don't know anything about that. I, the fact that I get to ask you firsthand, what was that like? Oh, it, it was amazing. First of all, it was my rookie year, so that rookie <laughs> mindset, especially coming out as free agent, man, you you're, you're alley dog, so you have no choice but to do the dirty work all the time. There, there's no I'm banged up on this like. You're a bubble guy. You got to get out there and get it. So that was just my mindset. So my helmet came off. I was like, uh, I got to get to where I got to get to, you know, swiftly. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so uh, I just took care of my business, man. I was always a dog, always a fighter. So that wasn't going to hold me back. Oh, but, with uh, that mindset, with that mindset that you had, with any games that you had to play through, some crazy injuries that you decided oh, not to, you, got, you just wanted to kind of Iron Man it out? Oh, man, you had to, man. Uh Training all the time, all the time is to get to Sunday, you know, get to Sunday, play through Sunday. Uh, and just coming from where I came from and playing through injury was nothing to me. You know, you tell me all I got to do is go out here and play with a, a tweak and hamstring, like, I'm going to go get it. You know, I, wa I wasn't going to do anything to put my life in danger, but uh, Jason Witten taught me if I can walk, I can run. And he, and he and he's one of the toughest guys to ever do it, man. Seen him play with a broken jaw, you know, a Absolutely. ruptured spleen, just that that gladiator mentality is 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 what we signed up for. and uh. It's just that grit, you know. So it's been times throughout my entire career that I had to get out there and just play with that grit. Yes, no, I hate you. Speaking about that grit and that grind, being from Dallas, Texas, how did, you, how did it feel to play for the Dallas Cowboys? You know, being from Dallas, that grit, that grind, you know, being homebred Dallas, Texas, and you're playing for the Dallas Cowboys. What is running through your mind when you're on that roster? Oh, man, a lot of pressure came with it. But uh, at the same time, the city was on my back, you know, and it was uh, I can't let the city down. I was playing for a bigger purpose than myself. You know, I was playing for the city that I grew up in, where I was raised at, you know, the the good, the bad, and the ugly, you know, of everything I went through in Dallas. So I had definitely support from the entire city, which which motivated me on days where I felt like I was tired or I didn't want to keep grinding, man. I knew I was grinding for a bigger purpose. I was grinding for another inner city kid that was like, man, can I make it to the NFL? And I was able to give that kid hope. You know, any kid in inner city Dallas, no clip that needed needed a reassurance or even uh, a glimpse of what he or she could be, you know, uh, of getting out of Oak Cliff. That was my mindset, you know, every time I strapped it on. Every time I strapped it on, every interview I had, how I conducted myself on and off the field was pretty much uh, an example or a, a, a shining light or a bright light for any other kid that was in inner city Dallas that was wondering, is it more than this? You know, so I just wanted to be the example to let them know, like, it's possible. I hate you. So going to Middle Tennessee State University with that, <clears throat> that chip on your shoulder, when did it all hit you where you're, you're in the Dallas Cowboys star, you're, you know, you're playing for the Dallas Cowboys as a running America's back. America's team. Like, okay. your first yeah. game, your first <laughs> game walking out of that tunnel <laughs> with, with a Cowboys jersey on. Did it ever hit you like, wow, I came from Middle Tennessee State University. I grinded. I got here. I'm finally here. But I'm not only here. I'm playing for the Dallas Cowboys, a team that I've probably been watching since I was a kid. Man, I, uh, I take it back even further. Uh, I came out a crazy year. I came out lockout year. Wow. You know, Ooh. so, of course, like I said, of course, I wasn't drafted. <laughs> so, after the draft, it, it was just silence. It was just silence. Uh -huh. You know, so uh, – my agent called me up and I told her, I was like, yeah, you know what? I just want to play ball. So I think UFL had a league up in Hartford, Connecticut. So I fought <laughs> Hartford, Connecticut. No way. Yeah, I fought a Hartford, Connecticut. And I said, I just want to play football. That's so my alma mater. Yeah, yeah so, so I'm in Hartford. I'm there for like two weeks and I ain't seen a piece of grass. I ain't seen a football. I ain't seen nothing but hotel meeting rooms. So they call <laughs> us up and say, you know what, guys? The league is canceled. Just like that. We're sending everybody back home. I'm oh. like, goodness gracious. So therefore, I, I go back to Murfreesboro. I'm still training, and I get a call from Skip Pete of the Dallas Cowboys. He's now he was my running back coach, and running back coach again here in Dallas. And I thought it was just somebody playing around on the phone and shit. You know, I got a nine. It was a nine seven two number. So I'm like, man, somebody from the crib just playing with me. You yeah. know, so you're like, man, this is Skip Pete. I want to give you the opportunity to make this team. I said, oh, that's all I need. That's all I need. You know, he said I can't offer you a signing bonus or anything. I said, coach, I don't need none of that. All I need is opportunity. So right. I hung up the phone. I told myself, I called a couple. I said, "Hey, I'm gonna make this team," and I had, I had. That, this was five minutes before I even, uh, even left to go to Dallas. I'm still in Murfreesboro. I ain't packed the bag. And I'm calling. He said, "Hey, look here, I'm gonna make this team." You know, so it didn't, it didn't have to be a, a game or even the fact of me putting on a helmet to say, 
this is it. It was just that that phone call and him letting me know that it was giving me an opportunity to make this team. And the rest was history. Wow. And, man, it's crazy. Just the, the path revealed itself when you got there. Yeah. yeah. Wow, to hear. So according to statistics, you ran a 4.59. I know you say that obviously the athletes are more faster. Obviously you have offensive linemen, you know, running 4.4. Right. Like history has never seen that before. If you were to run it today in your current condition, I know it's obviously not fair to ask this while we're all, <laughs> you know, we're watching TV, we're not doing much. But if you were to run a 40 time today, what would be your time? Let's speak on that four or five nine, first of all. You know, and, and, <laughs> Elaborate and, 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 I'm going by the statistics. I'm not yeah, a... No, 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 no. The, the statistics are correct. However, there's elements to it, you know, and that's the thing about the little school. We don't, we don't have indoor facilities. So if it's snowing on pro day, if it's cold on pro day, you got to get out there and still run, yeah. you know. So let's uh, start a GoFundMe. Let's get Middle Tennessee uh, an indoor facility. You know, so we don't have to post these times. You know, it was uh, 40 degrees and sleeting cold on my pro day. You know, so the 459, it's on there. But, you know, let's, let's add the elements into it. But right. for, uh, for Dallas Day, my personal workout, I went 445. But today, you know, I, I still think I can get it done. You know, I, I stay in shape. So I'm going to go – it's going to be better than 47. So it's going to be in the 46 range, man. If I had to get out there and, and lace it up, with probably two weeks of training. Get out there and give it <laughs> You know, four, six, seven, somewhere around there. I respect it. I <laughs> yeah, respect yeah, it. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt about it. So, so what was it like to play with guys like Des Bryant and Tony, Tony Romo? I know those are just legends. Obviously, you played with Jason Witten. What was it like to actually get in the locker room with those guys, put on the uh, uniforms, and go to war with those men who now, obviously, are Cowboy legends? Right. It was one of those things where you had to uh, be able to flip that switch on and off. You know, of course, you go home, you talk to your boys, hey, man, waiting in the locker room, wind works like this, Roman works like this. But once you get in there, you have to flip the light switch off, and it's your brother, it's your teammate. So uh, it's that competitive nature, and you see how hard they grind. Uh, Jason Witten was one of those guys I admire from afar. You know, everything Witten did, I did. You know, from if he took if he took two Tylenol for a game, I'm looking in the trash to see, okay, cool. He took two Tylenol, two Advil, I see the Raptors. You know, so that, that's what I'm going to do. Everything Witten's going to do. I'm finna do. So he's one of those guys that, man, I admire from the day I walked through the doors because I seen the work he put in. I seen the results he was getting. So that that admiration and that uh, that idolizing them. Of course, you do. You shoot shoot the shit with your boys the bar about it. But once you get in the locker room, man, it's you one of them, and you gain their trust and uh, their respect by getting out there and getting after it every day. So I seen some of the most competitive days, you know, at work, you know, with Dez and. And against Brandon Carr, against Mo Claiborne, you know, Romo at work against Sean Lee, me against Sean Lee, DeMarco Murray. So it was, it was a great experience to be around those guys. And after the fact, people can still say that PT was a great teammate. I think that's one of the most uh, comp the, the biggest compliments, the biggest accolade a guy can get coming out of a locker room was he was a great teammate. Absolutely. On that, on that same note, I know uh, Dallas is such a huge organization, such a famous organization. What was it like me? What was it like meeting the legend like Jerry Jones? Oh man, it was unbelievable. Uh, I think my first experience with, with Jerry was at training camp. Uh, I, had, I think of my second year, and he, and he called and he called me Philip, and he knew me by my first name. Uh, and that just goes to show that he's definitely invested into the entire organization. Uh, of course, you see media articles that slander him, but Jerry is one of the best ever. Man, you see him; he, he's he's visible. He's a, he's a player friendly owner, and again, I wasn't a number, I wasn't a last name. He knew me by my first name, you know, and I was a second, third string running back, you know, third down guy, pass protection guy, special team player. Uh, my jersey wasn't in the, uh, the gift shop, you know, so for him to be able to still come out and know me by my first name and speak to me and and just be down to earth with me, man, that that meant the world to me. And it wasn't just with me; it was it was every player on the roster, you know, from practice squad to your top guys like Tony Romo, he treated everyone the same. So that was the biggest thing about me with Jerry Jones, man. It just really took me over. And I think that's why win, lose, or draw, the success of this organization is unbelievable because how it's ran. You know, it's, it's ran first class in everything that we do from how we fly to how we travel to how we eat, how we uh, conduct training camp to how we conduct ourselves in the media. Everything that we do is first class. And it's, it's, it's mainly because of Jerry Jones and everything trickles down from there. Everything, every good business starts at the top. Oh, 100%. 100%. It, it, it's about culture. It's 
of setting Absolutely. that culture and, and from the top to uh, to the bottom or whoever you consider the bottom, everything around her, from the janitorial staff to the cafeteria staff, uh, the players, the strength and conditioning staff, the media, the journalists, everything you do has to be on that, that code of standards and that same culture. And if everybody moves in the same direction, you can't get your toes stepped on. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I know you came back for a short stint in 2018, but my question is, Philip, what is the biggest thing you learned about yourself after you got out of the NFL? Uh, I, I learned that you can a game to define you. Uh, that was one of my biggest fears in the game because I've seen so many guys that left the league and didn't know where to go with their lives. You know, so having a transition plan was, was huge for me. And even though you still had that transition, I, even though I had that transition plan, I still had bumps and, and bruises and hiccups because you, you miss that, that tribal effect, you know, and it's that tribal effect that you miss when you leave the league that I was like, man, I, I got to get into coaching. And that's something I wanted to do and I was so excited about with coaching because I still can scratch that itch of that competitiveness, that gladiator mentality, that being in the arena, you know, through coaching. So the biggest thing that I took from when I was in the league to now is just my mindset. You know, everything is mindset. You can't let the game define you. you Got to keep a smile on your face. Nothing is nothing is personal. It's all business. And just conducting yourself in that manner with that mindset and, and continue to have that grit and that attitude that I had when I was strapping a helmet on to when I'm just out here coaching kids now. Wow. Well, that makes sense. That's, that's greatly said. Uh, so, Philip, obviously the game has changed. You know, Zeke Elliott, obviously a beast for Dallas, you know, just got that new contract. But if it's not Zeke, who is it? So who is your favorite running back in the current day of the NFL as we know it? You know, it doesn't uh, have to be Zeke Elliott. You don't have to be that biased. But if, but if <laughs> it's running back, then I'll, I'll You know, uh, to be honest, my guy is Adrian Peterson, man. And uh, in, in a close second is Frank Gore. Because you say running backs are a dime a dozen, the tread and all this. But these guys are consistently year in, year out doing it and getting it done. Uh, I had a great opportunity to be in Buffalo with Frank Gore and just his mindset, how he prepared himself, how he went through practice, how he went through meetings. It, it's un, it's unbelievable, man. So those two guys, man, Frank Gore and Adrian Peterson, they're on a whole nother level, you know, but your Zeke's and your Saquon's, you know, your McCaffrey, those guys, they're up there, but longevity, you know, longevity. And those guys like Adrian Peterson and Frank Gore are, are unbelievable guys. No, I definitely understand that because you, you have to respect an OG, like I said earlier, because yeah. all through the media, all you hear is the slander. Once you hit 30 as a running back, you're done. They got to let you go. Don't waste your money on them. Right. They, they, they changed that. They changed that stigma right there. Both yes, of them. sir. Yes, sir. So, so oh, yeah, I have a question. So, Phil, so I, I always notice a huge difference in the NCAA football compared to NFL football. NCAA running backs go crazy, I notice. Yeah. They usually, I, at least in my perspective watching NCAA, I watch them gain, garner way more yards. Let's talk about the physicality and the difference between NCAA and NFL. I mean, were you kind of eating bigger hits from guys in the NFL? Uh, was the NCAA harder? What, what's kind of the comparison? What are the differences? Uh, NFL is definitely – a hundred times more physical. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, yeah, and that's not even get to Sunday. Just from practice, you know, it, it, it's definitely more physical than in college. One thing about college is uh, your conference schedule is your most important schedule. You know, those are your big games. So if I'm in an SEC, my non-conference games, I'm playing the Middle Tennessees and, and the Little Brothers, you know, and in the NFL, there's no Little Brothers, you know. So, so every game is a tough – physical game every practice is tough physical fast you know so that would be the biggest difference between college and nfl so you see some guys go crazy in college you know but it, it, it's it's a different world in the nfl the speed of the game the physicality the bigs you know the o-line and d-line is different so it, it, it's, it's a little different i'll talk to my guys today like a college highlight tape you see running backs go for it, 50 60 yards nfl highlight tape a 16 yard run is a highlight you know, so that just yeah. goes to show about the speed and the physicality, the difference of it. So, of course, the NFL is, is, is more physical and a lot faster. So, right Phil, to leave it off with this. Uh, what would you say to someone who just has a dream? You know, middle school, high school, they're grinding, but they don't know what it takes or how to get there. Speaking from a guy, you know, former NFL running back who had, who had history in the league, you know, running over people with no helmet into the end zone, the grit, the grind, never give up. 
Philip Tanner, what would you say to that kid who's trying to get to that to that level but doesn't know how to get there and what to do and what it does to take to, for him to take it? To, to, yeah. First of all, uh, I really believe in reading, you know, so so read up on guys that has gotten it done. And at the same time, go find the hardest worker and I'll work them. It's that simple. You know, uh, it, 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 it's separate base, of course, taking care of your body, eating right, but, but setting goals, being self-motivated, find things that motivate you, mindset. You know, uh, to this day, I still get up at 4.15, 4.30 in the morning. People ask why I say it, because it's hard. <laughs> because it's hard. That's why I do Definitely. it. Because Definitely. it's hard, and uh, it, it develops the, the self-discipline and that grit that I want out of life. So if I know my opponent is asleep at 4, I'm going to get up. Now, and he can not get up to eight, so I got four hours to get on him. I got four hours of work, four more hours of work to put in before he even get up. So I tell guys all the time, get up. Get up early. One thing all great men have in common is they get up early. Yeah, those so, 5 a.m.s are definitely going to pay off in the future. I think in the media, it's the same thing. If you're not doing something, someone else is going to outwork Someone else is. I, I take every single day where if I'm not doing something, someone else is doing something. When I want that position, something that I didn't do, they did, and I'm not going to be able to be qualified for that. Yes, sir. I, think, I think it's greatly said, Philip, uh, your advice for the younger generation. And I think it's really inspirational of how you got to the league. You know, being in the NFL shutdown, you don't know what's coming next. So I think it's, right. it's just a great story just to, to figure out how you did it in such a manner of the times that you were in. So thank you, Philip, for coming on. Um, hey, yo, I, I got one more question. Boy. How, do you, boy. how do you feel about uh, Tony Romo as an analyst now? Oh, man, he's, he's unbelievable. He, he makes me want to go uh, see if I can call games. The contract <laughs> and the money that I wrote get – uh, I, I got to figure something out. I mean, I'm in you, the wrong profession. You know, did, you, I, I, did you see any uh, uh, glimpses of that when you were in the locker room when you played? You're like, oh, man, this guy could be a good man, analyst. Most definitely. Ro Romo was always a, a Madden guy. You know, he was a hooper. He was the best at everything, man. It just – it's his personality. So I'm not surprised at all about how Ro does it and how he is able to see what things – what guys are doing. He was just that guy. It's just the, his demeanor, how he ran the locker room, how he operated on and off the field. And, it, and it's fun to him, and it comes it comes so natural. So I'm excited about it. Wait, you telling me Tony Romo was a hooper? Yeah, Ro, Ro can hoop now. Ro can hoop. Ro, 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 Ro was a sneaky good athlete, man. You know, he he, he was he a was sneaky good He was giving it athlete. to the brothers. He was giving it yeah. to the brothers on the court. That's what you're telling me. Ro, Ro can hoop. Ro can hoop now. Oh, <laughs> That's the last thing I thought I was gonna hear today. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be surprised, man. Like some white man can't jump stuff, you know. So you gonna come <laughs> to the park, man. You gonna come out there with Des Bryant, and they gonna be Wesley Snipes, and they gonna be like, "All right, man, he can't hoop." And Ro gonna give you buckets. He gonna give you crazy. buckets. Hey, shout out Romo then. Yeah. <laughs> shout out Tony Romo. But uh, now up next we have Robbie Berger, host of the Ridiculously Dumb Show on the Bro Bible. Once again, Philip Tanner, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate your time. It was great to talk to you. And good luck on your future endeavors. Hope we'll be keeping contact. Man, I appreciate it, guys. And uh, go blue. Hey, I hate you. Thank you, brother. <laughs> Stay safe out there, my man. Yes, sir. Y'all take care. Yes, sir. See you, man.